sorry about that. That's not the normal version we sing, but it was quite pretty. It was. Yes, it was. Thank you for that. All right, children may be dismissed for Children's Church. All right, I invite you this morning to open your Bibles to the Gospel of John once again. We're looking, we're looking today, what I call the, the worship of the believer. And today we're going to talk about just that. We're, we're, talking, we're going to talk about how we worship, if we even worship. We're going to talk about this story with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and they're going to show us what the worship really is about. We're going to take a look at that this morning. My passage is John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11 is our passage the worship of the believer. I invite you to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word. Beginning in verse 1, if you notice, the Bible says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bore what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing has she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Father, thank you for this account that we're reading today, that we're studying. And I just ask, Father, that you were to speak through me this morning, that we were to see the, the, the need for importance in a believer's life, the importance of it, and really what worship is. Lord, I, you deserve all of our worship. You deserve all of our affection. You deserve uh, Jesus Christ to be on the throne of our lives and Father, apart from that, then we are not, I don't feel like we're really worshiping you. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me, that we were to hear from you today, that you would be glorified and honored in all that we say and all that we do, that we make the wise decision today to worship you. We thank you, Father, for what you would do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Yeah, I've noticed ever since I've been saved, which is going on for uh, over 30 years now, that one of the biggest disputes and discussions of the American churches have surrounded, been surrounded by what is called the worship wars. The worship wars. And this battle has primarily been along the lines of what style, what kind of music is, should be sung at church. Should it be traditional? Should it be contemporary? Should it be choruses? Along with other aspects along that comes along with that, it's like, how do we do church? What is church supposed to be like? Is it supposed to be uh, entertainment? Is it supposed to be a skit and a play? Is it supposed to be all singing? Is it supposed to be jumping around, flopping on the floor, dancing all over the place, running around? I mean, how do we do church? You know, and largely because of how I was brought up uh, in Roman Catholicism, it was very conservative. But, uh, I, you know, because of that, I don't always connect with the newer versions of Christian music. Amen. But I am mature, I think, mature enough to realize that it's not so much of the beat that I try to listen to now, I try to just listen to the words. And I will say that some of these words of the music 
is one that I can relate to. Some are, are Christ-centered and focused. Worship is not about just singing songs. It's not about singing a chorus or some uh, popular music. Uh, worship is not about really how we do church. But what worship is, is where you and I come into play at, is worship is about one who loves the Lord Jesus Christ, and all we want to do is that we want to express that love to him. As we read in this chapter today, it's the beginning of the 12th chapter. It's a fairly long one if you look through it. And the majority of it, I know, is taken up with the account of Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem just a few days before the death on the cross. But, but John moves this narrative before he does move that narrative in that direction, he records for us a dinner. A dinner that has been given in honor of Jesus Christ at a very familiar town called Bethany. And the reason why we want to look closely at this passage of Scripture is because what transpired in this meal is a picture of of genuine worship. This is a picture of what real worship really is, but it also is going to show us the kind of warfare that the believer who worships the Lord will certainly face. You copy that? We're going to get down to the last point. If you're still with me, we're going to get with the warfare that the believer will have to face. But before I say all of that, I want to say this, that for the genuine believer, the one that has been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is worthy of our highest worship. And those of us that have been born again, we ought to respond to Jesus with genuine, passionate worship. I want you to think through this passage with me. And I want us to consider... What kind of worship are we looking at that the Lord has spelled out, laid out for us of how we're to worship the Lord in the same manner? I want us to look at this kind of worship that is shown in these 11 verses to show that this is how I need to be worshiping the Lord. This is how you need to be worshiping the Lord. Because where do we find in this passage? What we see is we see a, a diversity in worshiping Jesus. We see different methods, different ways right here of how Jesus is worshipped. Now we understand, we know that the most prominent and really the most dramatic worship we find in this text is that of Mary, right? Uh, but we look at this in just a moment, but there's a more types of worship that are going on in this scene. There's more of uh, the forms of worship. Let me first give you a definition of what worship is. Worship in the Greek is the word worth some. Okay, so you find something that you, are, that you hold to be valuable, something that is worthy, and you focus your attention and your, and your devotion on that. Uh, worship can also be described as giving honor and reverence to God. It, it means to bow down to God. That, that is what worship is. I'm afraid that some people have confined worship as what we do on Sunday morning, that you say, okay, I need to worship God. So I come in on Sunday morning, I, I sing three to five hymns, uh, I, I fellowship, I, I listen to the word, you try and stay awake during the preacher's message, I appreciate that. And, and, then, you, and then you leave here today, and, and you say, okay, I've done my worship, and I'm done for the week. And that's what a lot of people call worship. It's just a time of singing, uh, uh, praising, uh, praying. But listen, worship is so much more than just raising of hands. Worship is so much more than, than feeling good. What we see in this text is we see the truth, and what we see is that there is a diversity in how that we can worship God. And notice with me how, that we can know, know, uh, how we can worship God is, first of all, we can worship God by the fruit of our labor, by the fruit of our labor. John tells us in this uh, passage that six days before the Passover event that Jesus goes back, came back to Bethany, okay? That was the site of his latest and his greatest miracle, the rising of Lazarus from the grave. We looked at that last week. John tells us in verse 2 that they made him a supper, 
what kind of supper do you think they made them? I mean, this was, a, this was not an ordinary meal, right? This was a, a thank you, Jesus, for raising Lazarus from the grave. That was that. They weren't having, I, I don't know what they have, but it's not PB&J, okay? They didn't call in a pizza. I, I know that they didn't do that because this is going to be an elaborate meal. This is going to be a meal that is going to show their gratitude and thankfulness to Jesus. And the family of Lazarus wanted to express their gratitude to Jesus for what he had done. We would do the same thing, right? And notice what John says in verse 2. There they made him a supper and Martha served. Well, does that surprise you? Does that surprise you? That don't surprise me at all because whenever you want somebody something done, you find somebody who's the, most, the busiest. The busy people are the ones that get things done, and Martha's the one that's always busy. Martha's the one that's always serving. Martha's the get-to-and-get-it-done kind of a girl. I mean, she's the one that, that you know, whatever there's work to be done, you don't have to ask her. She's already doing it. And that's her makeup. Now, we know on one occasion in the Gospels that Martha was so busy uh, on one occasion fixing the meal that she was irritated because Mary, her sister, wasn't busy, that she was sitting at the, the feet of the Lord, of the Lord and, Je and Jesus had to gently rebuke Martha. But that doesn't mean that Martha's service was wrong. It just meant that her heart was wrong on that particular occasion. There's a time to sit and listen. There's a time to work and to labor. And her service to Jesus was, in, in John chapter 12, is an act of appreciation for the Lord. It was her reasonable service, okay? It was what she was to do. John, or Paul told the church in Rome in chapter 12, verse 1, that, and 2, that when we have the, our minds be transformed by the power of God, of God's word, our minds change, our habits change are different. We now begin to look at that we are going to offer our lives as a sacrifice to the Lord and to serve him and that is our reasonable service, the fruit of our labor. And this is exactly what Martha was doing. This was her reasonable service. Charles Spurgeon said about this text, he said it would have been a sad omission had there been no table spread for so blessed a guest and who could prepare it as well as Martha. You know, friend, some of the greatest acts of our worship that we can offer up to Jesus is the fruit of our labors. When we do anything productive in his name, for his glory, and for his uh, pleasure, it is an act of worship. We look at, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later on, but we live in a time that we were born for this time, okay? We were born for this time for 2020. When the government shuts down, the world shuts down, we see the COVID spreading, we see that, that um, this time in our lives where you and I are seeing the fulfillment of scripture before our very eyes, Jerusalem became the capital of Israel, we're seeing that America is losing the superpower status of the world, that you and I are going to be living in a whole different world here very soon. We see that there's the loss of the petrol dollar, that Russia and China are, are now trading back and forth with, uh, with, their, with the Chinese currency. I'm sorry, I can't remember it right now. But, and we see how Saudi Arabia and Russia have signed a military pact. Hey, I thought we had a military pact with Saudi Arabia. What do you think they're planning on doing? We're seeing all these changes taking place. We're seeing all these things. We're seeing that the government mandates. We're seeing mandates. We're seeing that so some of us have, have, are wearing our president's patience thin. We're seeing that there are this uh, loss of jobs that are going on. Let me tell you something, friend. When you keep the faith, when you steady the course, when you keep on the path that God has called you to do, it, that is your act of worship. It's just like this. It's, it's, let's look at the family for an example because your family's under attack. The dad's a spiritual leader of the family. There's no question about that. Listen, dads, this falls on your shoulders. Okay? This falls on your shoulders of getting your family into a closer relationship with the Lord. And you know what? Really, when you should prepare or make a decision of whether you're going to church 
or not on Sunday, you don't make that decision on Sunday morning. You make it on Saturday. That way you're in bed early on Saturday night. You wake up in the morning and say, wife, kids, we're going to church. But we don't want to go to church. We want to sleep in. Yeah, I want to watch Joel Olstein on TV. You know what? That's, I, know what they're, I know what you hear. Some of you dads are beta dads, okay? You're not alpha dads. You cower in, you follow in behind, you listen to your wife that she's the boss, she's the leader of the family, you do whatever she says. That ain't right. That's not what God's called you to do. You're the man. You're the have the backbone. You're the one that's supposed to make the decision. And let me tell you something, friend. Dads, when you would rather play golf on Sunday morning with your buddies... Or would you rather sleep in on Sunday mornings? Or if you got to get that deal done and signed and sealed and delivered on, by Monday and you got to stay uh, early on Sunday to start doing that, but you decide, hey, wife, we're going to go to church on Sunday morning. You know what? That is your act of worshiping God. Do you understand that? And for the wives, for the moms, you care for your children for Christ's sake. You teach them biblical morals and values. You instill in them godly convictions. You teach them right from wrong and not to compromise your convictions. You show them this is the truth and this is the error way. Do you see that your labor like that is the way that you worship the Lord? Do you know how you run your machinery at work when you do it for the glory of God? That's a way that you worship God. You see, this passage reminds us that not only does our labor is a way that we worship the Lord, but here's something else I want you to consider that we can glean from this passage is that the diversity of worship is also by the fact of our very lives. If you notice the verse 2 said, And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with Jesus. Lazarus was at the meal. Well, of course he was. You know, Lazarus was exhibit A. You know, I think Jesus was sitting here. I think Lazarus was sitting at the right hand uh, of the Lord. Jesus had performed that miracle, and, and the reason this thank you meal was being served was because of what Jesus did for Lazarus. Now, I think Lazarus is pretty interesting. Uh, Lazarus, you know what? There's nowhere in Scripture that's ever recorded of anything that Lazarus has said. Do you know that? And did you also know that there's nothing in Scripture that Lazarus had ever done? other than being raised from the dead, that's recorded in Scripture, you know? And so Lazarus is an interesting figure in Scripture. Apparently, the only thing that Lazarus did that was worth noting was that he died and Jesus raised him again. Well, my point in saying all of this is that the power of Lazarus is not in what he did for Jesus, but rather what Jesus did in and through him. You see, Lazarus' life itself is a testimony of the power and the glory of Jesus Christ. You know, there's some of you whose your very life means that this is how you worship the Lord. It is a, a godly life is always a testimony of the glory of God. How faithful that you are, what you're doing with your life. You see, because like for many, for all of us, we had what I call the B.C. days, before Christ days, okay? Some of you did not get saved till later in life, like myself, okay? So everyone knows back, and for Joe Martin, that I had my B.C. days. They knew that I was dead, okay? They knew that, that I was dead in my sins, but here's something is that they also saw when I was made alive, I'm saying that your life can be a wonderful testimony of worshiping the Lord when you're living for him. You see, for some of you, people knew, people knew that you were a train wreck. <laughs> people knew you were a lost cause. People knew that every time that you opened your mouth, there was profanity that poured forth out of it like a broken sewer line. People knew that every time that you reached out and, and you had a bottle in one hand and a weed in another hand, but now they see there's a Bible in your hand instead of the bottle or the weed. They see that when you open your mouth, it's praising to God rather than cussing or cursing God. It's undeniable. It's undeniable. 
Every time that you live, every day that you live, you are pointing people to the Lord Jesus Christ by your changed lifestyle because a godly life is always a powerful testimony. Let me quote uh, Spurgeon one more time. He says, there are some Christians who cannot do much or say much, but their godly lives, their quiet holiness, is a good witness to Jesus. Don't mistake me. I think we all should be worshiping the Lord as Mary did, but our worship should never be limited to some extravagant display of, uh, of affection. There is the diversity of worship from the fruit of our labor from also from the fact of our lives. But let's move on to a second point, because we've looked at Martha on our first point. Notice with me the demonstration in our worshiping Jesus. The demonstration in worshiping Jesus. The people in the room, they were enjoying a, a meal together. They were laughing and carrying on, just having a, a great time. They kept looking back and forth to Lazarus and to Jesus and, you know, just talking, just having a great time. I always wonder, well, what were they were talking about, you know? Uh, you know, I, I'm sure they're asking Lazarus, Lazarus, what was it like for those past two days, you know? When you were, when you were dead, wh where did you go? What happened to you? And, you know, can you imagine what Lazarus would have said when he woke up? You know, he, he, he was dead, but then he woke up. He said, man, I fell asleep for two days. I'm not going to fall asleep tonight at all. You know, that just that, that talking back and forth, that casual conversation of, uh, among friends. But then the meal was interrupted. It was interrupted by something that was both very unexpected and also as very uncomfortable for most of the people at the table. Mary came in. She knelt down at the feet of Jesus. The room grew silent as she broke open a bottle of perfume and then she poured it on the feet of Jesus Christ can you imagine the expression of shock that must have went around that table I mean Mary I'm, she, I know there had to be gasps and gawks but she ignored all of that because Mary wasn't worried about what anybody else was thinking Mary wasn't thinking about what other people were thinking. She had came, she had come there to worship Jesus Christ and to demonstrate for us some very important truths that we need to understand about worship. What is it that we can learn now from Mary's example of worship? First of all, worship is always expensive. Is always giving God the very best. John goes to great lengths in this passage, doesn't he, to make sure that we realize how costly and how valuable this perfume was that Mary just poured out on the feet of Jesus. Verse 3 tells us that Mary had somewhere around 12 ounces of an ointment called spikenard, which was extracted from a plant that was in India that was very expensive to to uh, the process of it to, uh, to turn into perfume. It was a, a favorite scent around Palestine, but everyone else, many people, could only uh, afford the generic brand that smelled similar, but was a lot less expensive, was not as fragrant. However, Mary had the real stuff. She had the, the very costly stuff. And we understand how expensive this was when Judas said in verse 5 that this ointment would cost as much as a yearly wage for someone living in that day. You know what? If we translate that to our time, okay, it, it would have been worth, listen, that bottle of perfume would have cost today tens of thousands of dollars. Now you're thinking, ah, no one, they don't make perfume like that anymore. Oh, yes, they do. If you believe everything you read on the, on the internet, I, I Googled this. You do it too, okay? Not now, afterwards. Clive, listen to this. Clive Christian Absolute Osmanthus Perfume. $10,000 an ounce. Today, you can buy that. Now, this is what I want to do. If I get Brother Don's credit card, 
I, I, I will buy that. I will buy it. And I'll share it with all of us. I will even wear women's perfume that's $10,000 an, an ounce just for one day just so I can smell pretty. But there is perfume out there that is that expensive. What's Mary teaching us? What Mary's teaching us is this, that cheap, easy, lazy worship is not fitting for Jesus. Half-hearted worship that costs you nothing isn't that kind of worship that he deserves. You know, the Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says that our eyes are fixed on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. It's when our eyes are, are fixed. What are your eyes fixed on? What do you look at? What are you focused on? What's your mind's eye or your physical eye looking at? Because here's, here's what I'm saying is that you will go where you look. You are going to go where you look at. And true worship involves a sacrifice of our heart's affections. I believe that the only time that we can be considered worthy of being or entering into the kingdom of God is when Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne of our lives. You remember last week I told you to look at your life as a kingdom? Well, who's sitting on the throne of your kingdom? Who's sitting on the throne of Joe's kingdom? The kingdom of Joe. You know, who is on that throne? Because it could be your job. You know, it, it can be your pleasure. It, it could be money. Yeah, it, it could be any number of things. But this is what I'm saying is that I believe that all other affections must be subservient to having a right relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, uh, you go where you look. And what we're seeing with Mary is we see that she was focused on Jesus. But notice not only the expense of her worship, but notice the expression of it. As I've said, Mary took this very expensive uh, perfume, poured it onto the dirty, callous feet of our Lord, and then she went a step farther. She did something that... Um, was very shocking, and some might even say shameful act in that day, and that was that she let her hair down, and she wiped up the excess perfume from the feet of Jesus Christ. If you had lived in the first century at this time, a person living in that time would have uh, probably would have cringed when they saw a woman allowing, letting her hair down because it was an awkward and and uh, an uncomfortable sight. What was she doing? Author Leon Morris said, to attend to the feet was the task of the most lowly slave so that Mary's actions involved great humility as well as great devotion. What Mary was doing was that she was humbling herself publicly and showing by this act how much she recognized the glory and the majesty of God. I think there are some people here that would never publicly praise and worship Jesus Christ because simply because you're afraid of what other people will think. We've learned in Theology 101 years ago that whenever we sit down for a meal, we don't matter where we're at, who we're with, it doesn't matter. We give thanks to the Lord. I think a lot of people won't do that. Some people in the professional realm, they're too professional that it might harm their advancements if, they, if their superiors see them bowing and, and, and praying to God. Um, I think that there are times when people will never shout praise the Lord in the midst of company. They will not seek after prayer. They will not say, mention anything at all about Jesus Christ because they're too afraid of what people will think about them. They'll never share their faith because they're afraid that they will be ostracized, that they would be laughed at. And yet, I believe that if we really know who we are and who Jesus is, 
We should never worry about embarrassing ourselves. John says that the smell of the perfume filled the room. Everyone got a whiff of Mary's worship, but the smell wasn't for them. It was for Jesus, and Mary didn't care whether they liked it or not. There's a third area we want to take a look at here, and that is the demonstration is we see also that there is the extent or the expectation of her worship as well. I love what Jesus said about Mary's act of worship when Judas criticized it. Jesus said, leave her alone. Then in verse 7, he says, against the day of my bearing has she kept this for the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. It seemed like Mary knew what was coming for Jesus. She would have been in Jerusalem. There's talk has been around that they were going to put Jesus to death. Mary knew that that Jesus was going to die. And she had that ointment stored up to anoint his body after his death, but apparently she decided that she wanted to use it now before he went away to death. Mary's expectation was this. I'm going to see him like this. I'm not going to see him like this after he dies. I want to show him my love now while he is here with us. And like Mary, there ought to be an expectation in our worship as well. Mary worshipped in anticipation when she should see him no more. But we worship in anticipation when we leave this world and we see him for the first time. We worship with an expectation. Like the song says, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. You see, there's the diversity in how we worship the Lord. This is the demonstration on how we do worship the Lord. But we have to look at one more point, and I think that this is I always trying to save the last point as the, the, the big finale. We see the, the danger in worshiping the Lord. Um, Because if you're going to worship the Lord as Mary and Martha, if you're going to serve the Lord, then you need to be ready for a fight. Because the critics and the devil will be ready to attack you. I don't have anything really much to say. Um... That's really, um, that really I have thought out much. I scribbled them down on paper and uh, because I think that this is something we all need to hear. In 2020, the local Christian churches in America took a roundhouse kick to the face. The government told us we need to shut down, and we shut down. What we found when that happened was after the effect, the effect, we saw how the the separation of the wheat and the tares. You know the parable when Jesus talked about the wheat being the believers, the tares being the unbelievers. He used that as an analogy, wheat and weeds. That roundhouse kick to the face separated the wheat from the tares in many ways. It showed the churches, the churches exactly what they really were. Nothing more than a feel-good country club, do-paying building organization for many churches. They found out that the roundhouse kick to the face was because for many churches they stopped preaching the word of God years before and they focused just on entertainment. They just want an emotional high. They want that buzz emotionally. Wouldn't say anything to make anyone mad because that would cost them. I will say 
that this church will never mute the word of God. Do you remember, and I'm saying all that because times are coming. That if you're not focused on the Lord, if you're not worshiping the Lord, you're going to be among the tares. Not that it will change, it's just that you'll be revealed that you're just part of the tares. Do you remember um, the night that the angel of the Lord came to Israel came to the Jewish people when they were slaves in Egypt. And um, they said, if you put this lamb, the blood of the lamb on your doorpost, the angel of the Lord will pass by you. If not, then every firstborn child from the Pharaoh to the servant and even their animals, the firstborn when the angel of the Lord passes by will fall to the floor. And what made, what made this night so amazing that was different than any other night was this, because the Jewish people... They obeyed the Lord. They were sitting in their homes, in their uh, small groups. They were having the fellowship. They were eating the meals. And then the wailing, the crying, the screaming, the chaos came. And what they heard outside was this. They heard a world that just took a roundhouse kick to the face. Um, it all boils down to this, friend. Who is your God? Where you look, that's where you're going to go. You can talk the talk. We're good at that. But all I'm saying is the evidence is here. Who is your God? Who do you bow down to? Who are you going to listen to? Who do you think that's going to uh, take care of you? You know who takes care of, of my, me and my family? The Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. That's who takes care of me. I don't eat from the hand of the government. I don't eat from the hand of my employer. I eat from the hand of God who protects and provides for me and when we can get in this mindset when we get in this frame of mind that God is sovereign that he is worthy of all of our worship that he is the one that is sitting on the throne of my life he takes my life and he provides for every need that I have are you ready for a tsunami that's coming are you ready for this tsunami that the liberals are coming after the, the church is next? After your families, after your, for many that are sitting here, you're going to lose your job soon. I'm probably one of them. Does the government scare me? No. Not at all. But I'm not going to bow down to them. I won't, I won't kneel to them. I will not obey them. I do not, I do not feed, they do not feed me. It's the Lord that feeds me. The body of believers, when threatened with the loss of freedom or our Christian liberties being taken from them, is what we're, I'm seeing here in the very, very near future. What this does is this. It separates the wheat from the tares. It separates who are you worshiping. I always believe that the pers persecution of the church, it will drive growth, okay? It will separate those that do not belong. It will bring in those that are true born-again believers. This regime in D.C., I call it regime because it's been stolen, taken from us, so it can't be an administration, right? Administration is when it's legally voted on. The regime is when it's forcefully taken. Okay, so I got that straight. So, yes, this regime that is in D.C. has been successful in scaring many people thinking, for some people here, that your next meal is coming from the government. 
I believe if you reframe your mind into believing that this liberated belief system that I am supposed to be putting Jesus Christ first in my life and in my faith, then the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, he is the one that will provide for me and my family. Again, I don't eat from the hand of the government. I don't serve him, them. I serve the king of glory, the Lord of lords. That's who my worship is. My friend, listen, if you're not prepared, you need to get things ready, because it's coming. It's coming down the pike. It'll be here quicker than you think it will. And when it starts coming, it will happen so fast, it'll be too late. So my challenge to you today is, first of all, your soul, your soul is the most important thing you possess. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you're not sure about it, now's, today's the time to get things right. Okay. Today's the time to make sure that you are indeed been saved. If you have been saved, if you're in your body's your kingdom, but Jesus Christ is not sitting on the throne of your kingdom, you need to wonder, you need to ask yourself, why isn't he on my, the throne of my life? And to make him the throne of your life. Today, in the quietness of your own heart, don't care what other people think. Don't be embarrassed by it. You come forward if you want. I just want to see it get done. I don't care if you do it in your pew. Do it here at the altar. I don't care. I just want you to do it. To get things right with the Lord. So whatever the Lord has spoken to you about this morning, here he's waiting for a response from you. Okay? And we dare not, when someone's speaking to us, just walk away from him or them without a response we won't do it to the lord either so whatever god has laid on your heart to do whatever that you may be worshiping that's not him put it down drop it to the floor put the lord jesus christ on the throne of your life let's pray together father i thank you for the example of mary and martha of their way that they worshiped you Thank you, Father, for the diversity that we have. And worshiping is more than just singing or singing choruses or just shouting out loud. It's, it's about our labor. And we know that whatever it is that we offer to you, it's always expensive. It's always our very best. Lord, I pray for that born-again believer today that may have had idols set up in their lives that are sitting on the throne of their lives and Father, I believe that you have convicted them of that and that they would do the right thing right this time, that they would respond properly to the wooing of the Holy Spirit. Maybe for some that's hearing my voice today, they've never trusted in Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. Father, your word tells us that if they call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. That the Wages of their sin is death, but the gift that God gives to them is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Father, I pray in the quietness of their own heart that if they were not sure that they're saved, that they would call out to you this morning. Call out to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We thank you, Father, for what you would do in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We stand. <clears throat> Turn to hymn number 517, 517.